wouldn't it be great if all of the heroes in the Bible were really good all the time and all the villains were really bad all the time but it isn't actually quite like that the Bible demonstrates all of the character types they're real people isn't that amazing they are real people and we're seeing stories of people just like you and me Jacob a man who grasped hold of the, the, the inheritance and yet he was the one that carried the blessing after his brother had despised it he's found himself 20 years serving his father-in-law and in that time jealousy has crept in bitterness and anger and it, Jacob and his wives are just so uncomfortable and now God is telling them it's time for you to go back God is in the process of redeeming what he has begun. He's protected his inheritance in a place away from the limelight. And now Jacob is going back. And we have this situation where God says, I'm going to do this with these sheep. All about the speckled ones and the brown ones and all the rest of it. And we find Jacob again trying to do it his own way with sticks and stones. Well, that's not seeing Jacob he's always trying to do it his own way God is moving him along and he's always trying to do it his own way doesn't that sound like some of us and then we find them going and we find this crazy situation where Rachel has stolen her father's gods right after we've got Jacob telling her that the God of the universe is doing this through us and has spoken to us She's still hanging on to her father's gods. How easy it is for us to hold on to superstitions, hold on to our ways of doing things, when God has said, I'm doing something else because I'm doing a redeeming work amongst you. Just as we begin today, we just recognise this. Jacob's coming back, coming back from his bronco Laban's house, and he's met by angels. He recognises actually that I'm in God's path. I'm in God's place. And I don't know if that was in his mind before, but he humbled him and he sent ahead of him. The message is saying to his brother, I'm coming humbly. He was obviously concerned of what was going to come. And then here in the day, Esau, who knows that his brother's already stolen his birthright and stolen his blessing, perhaps he's now going to come and steal his wealth, set off to meeting with 400 men. We read in, later on in this reading today that, we, that Jacob sent all the family in little groups. And it certainly had some effect on Esau because by the time they met together they were ready to cry in each other's arms. They were reconciled together. And I'm sure God loved that reconciliation. But before that, Jacob had stayed behind in the camp. And we read about him wrestling with God. In the process of that, God touched his hip and put his hip out and for the rest of his life it was a sign on Jacob that he had wrestled with God and limped. But God also changed his name to Israel. And when we hear that name, we think of such wonderful things, of what God has done, the promises that God has made to Israel. But actually the word means one who struggles with God. And that really has been the story of Israel's history for the last three and a half thousand years. There were a couple of other things that were important today that are worth noting. Yesterday we heard as the there was a search going on for the idols. But Jacob said, if anyone's stolen them, they will die. And we read of those words ringing true as Rachel dies as she has Benjamin. And then we have the story of the the young men at Shechem. And what's significant here is that we're beginning to meet the, the 12 young 
followers, the, the 12 young sons of Jacob. And we'll start seeing them in their true lights, one after another. Here we have Levi and Simeon tricking a whole tribe into um, going for circumcision and then slaughtering them in revenge. Their dad says, you've made us a stench. They, they were meant to be a blessing. God's word is for his people to be a blessing. But they keep doing things that make them a stench to the neighbours. And then we have Reuben. Reuben, the oldest of all of the children of Jacob. Sleeping with his father's concubine. And becoming an offence even to his father. God has a call on this family. And yet we see them trying their best to disqualify themselves in the process. In today's readings, we've read through the genealogies of Esau, the whole family line. And we've also read the families of the people who lived in the area before Esau came and took over. It's interesting as we read it that some of the names that come up are actually people who we'll see later. Amazingly in the book of Job, perhaps that's helping to date that book and the position of where that book was. But something very special is going on here. We're seeing people who have had a call and it I just felt there was a word I want to share today that I think we're going to hear time and time again during this year. It's not the way we start, it's the way we finish. It's not the way we start, it's the way we finish. And for Esau, he had the opportunity of starting well, but finished badly. We'll see for Jacob, he succeeded in starting badly but finished well. When we see that his name is written in Hebrews 11, and the thing that he's noted for is that he passed on the vision to the next generation. The sad thing as we read these genealogies is that the vision isn't being passed down from generation to generation. this passage you begin the story of Joseph starting with his dreams and his famous coat his sailing into slavery his a wrongful accusation and being thrown in prison but in the middle of the story we find the sad tale of Tamar and Judah Judah the third son of Jacob has left the rest of the family and gone to live among the Canaanites and has married a Canaanite wife. He has three children. The first one is married to Tamar. He died. The second one married to Tamar and acts wickedly and is, is, is killed. Judah, afraid for the third one, hides him from her. Tamar is left a widow and childless and absolutely culturally worthless in those days. She takes the opportunity of pretending to be a prostitute and Judah doesn't take much to fall for it. She becomes pregnant. And yet, this story is so strange to our ears. We find that God has actually allowed the intervention. There is Judah heading off in the wrong direction. And Tamar, in her righteousness, succeeds in bringing Judah back onto track. One thing that I've thought about as I've read this passage over, just realising that there's a handful, maybe 70 people, who are part of Abraham's descendants at this time. They are so in danger of just being swallowed up by Canaan. God is doing something to protect his line.
We continue reading today, finding Joseph still in prison, forgotten, and suddenly remembered, brought before Pharaoh, presented with a dream, and yet admitting, I can't do this, but God can. And then we come into one of the most amazing passages in Scripture where God reveals his plans, not just for Egypt, but just as he revealed to Noah a little while ago, how to build the ark. Here was Joseph with the plans for how to build a new ark for the people. We're going to see a time of famine. And historically, you'll, if you study it, you'll find whole cultures are going to disappear in these next few years. But yet, God has made a place, not only for protection, for growing of his people. He'd spoken to Abraham just a little while ago that it was going to be a time when the people were going to be in captivity for 400 years. This was not a punishment, this was a protection. This was going to be something amazing. And the outworking of it is what we will see over these next few days. Today's passage is one of the longest that we'll be reading in this whole year. Seems like we've read for pages, but today we've seen the most amazing story of reconciliation. Joseph, sent into slavery, now exalted to a leader in Egypt, meeting his brothers for the first time in years. We see a story that has the most amazing forgiveness and restoration of a relationship. But you've got to ask, when did Joseph choose to forgive his brothers? And I think the answer is that he probably even forgave them in that pit. Even as he was being taken by the Ishmaelites to Egypt, even when he was cast into prison, he chose to forgive his brothers so that when it came that he met them again, there wasn't a question, shall I forgive them, shall I not forgive them? But what if all the questions, what was going on? God was showing Joseph how to test their hearts, to find what was in the hearts of his brothers. Were they in a position to receive that forgiveness? Or were they still as bitter and angry as ever? He discovered that their hearts had softened. They realised their sin. And because of that were able to receive that forgiveness. Jesus forgave us on the cross. What he looks for is the day of finding whether our hearts have softened so that we can receive that forgiveness today. In today's passage we have Pharaoh's invitation to Jacob to come on down to Egypt. Seventy people go down and begin to settle there. We just begin to see some of the amazing wisdom of what's going on here. God is making a place of protection for his people. A place where they can grow and be established. It's not giving too much away to say that in a few weeks time we're going to be reading about millions of the people of Israel leaving out of Egypt. But at this time God has made a place of protection, a place of security. How did he do it? God made these people into farmers, into herdsmen, into shepherds. And actually we find that the Egyptians hated shepherds. And so they just left them alone. And they began to grow in number. The other thing we see was the wisdom that God had given to Joseph. And so, in the middle of this famine, all of the land around became the property of Pharaoh. The people were protected by God's goodness, using the world to do it. But it was God's goodness.
Today we finish the last part of our adventure of reading through the Bible in a year. We finish the book of Genesis. And at the end of this chapter we're going to have 280 years of silence before we move on. But there's just a couple of things that are really, really worth noting in here. We have the time when Jacob blesses his sons and he speaks to them blessing but he speaks to them recognizing who they are we see the characters of these men being exposed and yet they are there part of God's promise they're not there because they're wonderful people they're there because of the faith of Abraham and now we also see this amazing statement that I think every one of us have seen in our own lives when Joseph says to his brothers what you meant for harm the Lord has made for good I think it's in our own lives we find these places where it seems like everything is against us but actually the Lord is using it for his purposes mm -hmm.